Hello, everyone. That's the first event. Thanks for having me. Let me just get my props working. Uh, I was just napping over there. So just bear with me one second, and we should be all ready to go. All right. OK. So uh, do I have us? There we go. All right. Can everyone see me OK? Whoa. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Amir. I'm the founder of uh, Bioconscious Technologies. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, what we do. Um, we are a an analytics company that uses uh, machine learning uh, when it comes to healthcare data. Now, this PowerPoint was exported from a Mac to a PC computer and then into Google. So just bear with me if, if things show up on all the wrong places. So what is machine learning? Um, and we, we hear that a lot these days. And you know, a lot of it, it's become an umbrella term. So there are two major types of machine learning. There's um, supervised machine learning, which is known as function estimation, where you are essentially trying to solve a problem, and you come up with a, with a function that is going to estimate the output for you. Um, it's great, and it's, it's nothing new. It's been around since the um, you know, late 1970s, and almost any digital or electronic device that you come into contact with has a certain level of, of supervised learning built into it already. Uh, its badass cousin that came around around uh, the 2000s is actually unsupervised machine learning. And this is where you design a dynamic algorithm that is able to adjust its decision making based on the type of information and the data that you actually feed the algorithm. Uh, and this is more of, of what we talk about. It came about around uh, the 2000s, roughly, so to speak, and it actually works better. In, in practical sense, what do the two have in common? In, um, how can we use them? If you want to apply machine learning to your own startup or what you're working on, uh, supervised learning requires structured data. So you have to have a nice, neat database of in, in, like data, essentially. And they have to all be sort of interrelated and you have to define it. And the other thing is you have to select a subset of, of what's known as a training set and you feed that through your algorithm. And most often than not, what ends up happening with supervised learning algorithms is that at some point, uh, your accuracy would plateau. Uh, and essentially, from that point on, if you train the machine on more data, your accuracy is actually going to drop. When it comes to unsupervised machine learning, um, you don't really need structured data. You can feed it any type of unstructured data um, and essentially just, just chug all the data. The more you have, the better, into the machine. And what you see is that there's no overtraining. So with a lot of uh, unsupervised machine learning algorithms, uh, there is no um, overtraining. There's no accuracy plateau. Uh, there will be diminishing returns but you will find out what we call uh, conditional outliers um, that are within your data. So they both have their own pros and cons depending on the type of problem that you want to solve. What we focus on right now is essentially a combination of, of the two, uh, but more closer to unsupervised learning than supervised learning. So let's look at how we can, we can use machine learning algorithms in, in essence. So you can, you can use machine learning algorithms to classify things. So, you know, yes or no, is this black or blue, is this a cat or a dog? Uh, you know, that's, you know, very general basic classification problems. You can also use this to solve uh, regression problems. So Elon Musk just smoked weed on camera. How's that gonna affect Tesla's, yes, thank you. Um, how's that gonna affect Tesla's uh, stock market price? And, and how's that gonna change? And the, the third one that I look at it is that you can, you can solve, use machine learning to solve prediction problems. So the prediction problems are a combination of classification and, and regression problems working hand in hand, but it's way more sophisticated. Uh, and, and the output, interestingly enough, is, is something very simple. Will this patient die in the next you know, 72 hours or not? Right? And, and you have a lot of analytics that goes in, into the algorithm. That's where, where we focus right now, is trying to essentially predict. But you know, the first lesson that we learned is, uh, you know, predictions are great if done accurately, where can we apply it? So three years ago, when I was a, a master's student at UBC uh, for computer science, I had this crazy idea that what if we had a computer algorithm, it's called the crystal ball, and what if we could, we could feed unstructured data to the crystal ball, let's say, you know, activity, heart rate, Apple Watch data, and all that stuff. And then on the other hand, it could tell us, you know, if we're going to get sick, uh, when we're going to get sick, what condition we're going to have, like what kind of disease we're going to have, and, and if we could potentially prevent it. Uh, now, the first time I remember I ran this by my principal, you know, the PI on the thesis, uh, they, they literally thought I was crazy. So they told me, like, I'm trying to boil the ocean, it's not possible, it's not feasible, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I thought deep down that it's, it's actually possible. It's, it's you know, it, it's doable. We can do it. So 
the question changed to, yes, it's possible, I think it's possible, but where can we show proof of concept? So there's this disease known as diabetes, affects about 10% of the general population globally, uh, and, and more people than you know have this disease. You know, Halle Berry, Jonas Brothers, Theresa May, they all have this disease and, and they're trying to control it. The problem with the disease is uh, glucose. The body has lost its innate capability to manage glucose, and, and for most of you, your glucose is very well under control, so you don't know it, your body is, is trying to control it. But for a patient with diabetes, because they've lost that innate capability, uh, if it goes too high and stays there for a long period of time, there's blindness, uh, limb amputation, strokes. If it goes too low, um, you essentially expire in, in a matter of three to seven hours. So at any moment in time, a diabetic is about three to seven hours away from death. So, and the problem seems to be glucose management. So we figured, okay, great, let's, let's test this. So what if we could pull data from continuous glucose monitors that are already on the market and diabetics are using it, and then we pair that information from heart rate and activity that's coming from, let's say, an Apple Watch or Fitbit, uh, and, and you know, feed all this data into the crystal ball, would the crystal ball be able to predict future glucose values? Uh, I thought that was a cra you know, crazy idea, but it's doable, so we, we wrote a prototype. Um, and then before I progress, just to give you an idea of the technology today, even if you have both of those devices, the data from those devices are segregated. Your, your fitness data from the Apple Watch is segregated on, on the fitness apps. Your uh, glucose data is on your glucose app. They don't even show up on the same screen. So we pull all that information together. We feed it through the, the crystal ball, what we call the crystal ball. And in essence, it predicts users' future glucose values. So we thought this was a you know, pretty good idea. We went to BC Children's Hospital. And wow, I think we, we achieved 110% accuracy on this slide. Um, we went to BC Children's Hospital and we said we have this you know, compelling idea and we want to test it. And to our surprise, they actually let us test it with, with their patients. And we found out over there that for, uh, again, excuse the, uh, the positioning, but essentially 90% is where we need accuracy. And even Medtronics and all the big companies uh, couldn't really do it beyond 30 minutes. But we were able to achieve that level of accuracy and even higher for 60 minutes, which is the, the, the pink line up top, which was extremely empowering uh, from an entrepreneur's perspective. Uh, but, you know, the pilot study was uh, so hard on us that we actually ran out of, like, almost everything that we had uh, money-wise and, and energy, so to speak. But anyways, so when that time came, I said, you know, let, let's screw it. Let's just release it on the App Store, see what happens. Uh, this is what it looks like. And in essence, it, it shows... Uh, I wonder if I have a laser pointer on this one. Yeah, we, I do. Okay. So this is what it looks like. It shows you how... You were doing 60 minutes, 30 minutes ago, right now, 30 minutes from now, 60 minutes from now. And that's essentially 60 minutes ago, uh, sorry, right now and then an hour from now. And so, you know, I was super excited about it. We, we knew it worked, so we released it on the App Store. And what we found out was, so this is a typical uh, glucose behavior for, for a patient with diabetes. This is, this is how it looks like. So, uh, you start off the morning, you know, we all eat breakfast, they can't because, holy shit, they're high. They have to bring it down over here, insulin, oh crap, it went too low, eat a little bit more, goes up, too high, insulin, comes down, it's alright, eat a little bit, oh crap, it's high again, insulin, comes down, goes up again when they eat, and then, crap, you know what, it's too high, I've had it, it's towards the end of the day, so I'm just going to take a long dose, like a large dose of uh, gluc insulin, bleh. <laughs> so it's going to come down over here, cognitive impairment, go back up again, so it's, it's always this zigzag. This is, an, is data from an actual patient one day after they downloaded the app, and this is the same patient three weeks after they used their predictions. Check this out. Yeah, I know. I, uh, I was surprised myself too. So we went from this to this. Smaller doses. We notify them where to... Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. So, so we went from that to this. I was super excited about this. So we released the app on the App Store. Uh, we, we reached more than 5,000 uh, users in less than three months. Uh, and that's when we ran out of money. Uh, generating predictions actually take, is, is very cost intensive because we have to have servers in the background that have uh, all these different algorithms trying to predict the correct value. And they compete one another because we use an ensemble of methods, which are three different methods. So we just put up a paywall, and we encourage people to pay for it. Uh, and, and some people have done, but I don't feel comfortable sharing that number yet. It's not that high. 
Uh, but essentially, we're trying to get everyone to pay for it because from this point on, it actually makes no sense for us to run it for free. Uh, and with that said, we've, we've just started tinkering around with other types of data input. So we've, we've started looking at how we can predict blood pressure using information from Apple and Fitbit Watch, like the heart rate, as well as you know, output, blood pressure output from these devices. And um, you know, we, we know that it's, it's, it's achievable. It's actually feasible to predict blood pressure ahead of time with a reliable margin of error. Uh, and we started looking at uh, Bloom Life, which is another company in the States. They're, they're kind of struggling right now. But they make these sensors for women at risk of, of uh, pregnant women at risk of preeclampsia. And what we're able to do with the output from their sensor is to actually predict if the mother is going to have an episode and whether or not they need to rush to a hospital because there's an imminent muscle contraction coming that could um, result in you know, a neonatal birth. So with that said, our app is called Diabetes. So if you know anyone who has diabetes, tell them it's, it's free for 31 days now. Download the app. <laughs> Download the app, test it out. Even if they don't want it, they can delete it after 31 days, but we still collect their data, and it allows us to adjust our algorithm so we can make better predictions for other people. Um, so that is my presentation. Thank you very much. Amazing presentation. Any questions in the audience here? Yeah. How secure is your data? Do you have information about who the person is, or what do you do to protect them? Well, we are, we're HIPAA compliant. The Canadian equivalent is PIPEDA. So it's end-to-end -end, uh, encryption in flight as well. Uh, which is interesting about the, what we do is we actually train an algorithm. We don't hold people's data. So uh, the data comes in. We have a certain subset that we, we collect. And then we train the algorithm. Once that is done, we don't really keep the raw data. We actually send it out. But at any moment in time, we have a good idea of where the user is, approximately, what they're doing, and on top of it, the system is trying to target, figure out what the target variable is. Like, so in this case, it's glucose. On top of it, what it's trying to guess is where they're probably going to go, what they're going to do there, and how the target variable is going to react there. What we found out is, for instance, if it's sunny outside and you're diabetic, you most likely have better glucose control. We don't know why. We just know that you know, people end up being more active. It could be vitamin D but they end up having more control over their glucose. If it's you know, running outside, if it's overcast, you'll most likely end up trending high. Yeah, that's an interesting fact. Amazing. Uh, any, other, any other questions there? Oh, yeah. Are you looking for users today, or just to get the word out? Are you looking for investors? Users, investors, all of the above. <laughs> yes, which one are you? Uh, all right. Let me give you my number now. <laughs> yeah, uh, I did see one. Did I see a hand up here quickly? Okay. Uh, last question, and then we got to. Okay. Sorry, what was the question? Future products. Yeah, so, so these will be our future products. Uh, essentially, the same type of. I don't really want to touch hardware. Uh, because it's, it's very cost in intensive. So prototyping for us takes 20 minutes. Prototyping for a hardware company takes 20 days, 20 months. Uh, I, I work at SFU Venture Labs. I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, some of the other speakers do as well. Uh, and we have a lot of companies over there that work with hardware. And you know, I get them, I get, like, they get super excited when there's a new prototype coming out of the lab. And they're just like, yeah, this is a new prototype. And then testing, like, oh, crap. You know what? Another two weeks, we have to design another one because this didn't work out. But for us, it's just like, oh, take out a one line of code and then put something else in there. So th that's the reason I, I personally don't want to get into you know, the hardware stuff. Anyways, thank you very much.